Anybody here ever had hand-me-downs? Quite a few hands go up there. It's really nice to get some hand-me-downs, but they're usually used, aren't they? A little faded. They're just not like the new stuff, is it? Doesn't have that smell, doesn't have that crispness. There's just something about hand-me-downs that come at a, a, a right time sometimes. But then sometimes when we get those hand-me-downs, those clothes, that we get those hand-me-downs, we want to take them and we want to wash them with our detergent, our Clorox, dry them our way. And so it kind of changes it and makes it ours, doesn't it? Well, this morning, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about hand-me-down religion. Hand-me-down religion. So one of the questions that I, I thought of was, is it working for us? Is it, is it really working to be handed down? A second-hand religion. Well, first of all, if you got your Bible with you, turn in your Bible to Mark 7. I want you to see this. And this is, this is just the beginning of some of the things that I was talking about when I, I, I say hand-me-downs. So I wanted to get you to thinking about hand-me-downs, and then I want you to start thinking about your own faith and the things that, that you believe and the things that you do. And we'll see in just a minute some, some others. If you got your Bible, turn to Mark 7, verse 6. We catch Jesus in the middle of a discussion with the Pharisees, the Pharisees over dishwashing. Okay? But listen, he, they, the, the Pharisees see them, they're, they're, washing, they're not washing their hands to eat, or they didn't wash them the way they washed them. They didn't wash the dishes the way they washed them. And so they ask this question, why don't your disciples uh, walk according to tradition? All right, that word's going to come up a lot in this, uh, a lot. But it goes on to say, verse 8, he answered them and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? He's talking about y'all. That's what Jesus said. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Do you see where I'm going? Do you see where I'm going with that? Look at 7. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The commandments of men. He goes on 8 and he says, For laying aside the commandment of God, in other words, that laying aside, let go, uh, ignore, disregard, they neglected the commandment of the Lord. Goes on to say, You hold on to the traditions of man. The traditions of men. Because he goes on to say, to finish out this, of the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things as you do. But my point is, is he's saying, teaching the doctrines of the commandments of men, the tradition of men, because traditions kind of come in a lot, don't they? Traditions sometimes, will, we'll make it a law, won't we? That we should be doing it. All right, he goes on. Look at nine. And he said to all of them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Those traditions, man, they can jump up there pretty high, can't they? The things that we've always done, we've always seen them done in our church, the things that we've always seen in Christians' lives and they do it and, and everything, we can kind of make that a tradition. But you too well reject the commandment of God that reject right there, listen to what that word means. You skillfully sidestep, you find a way, and you are experts in setting aside the commandment of God that you may keep your own traditions. Do you see how important that is? So this morning as we talk about hand-me-down religion, are we just going through the motions when we come to church? Are we just coming to church because our parents came to church and brought us to church? 
Are we just going through the motions? Are, are we following the rules? The rules of you got to go to church on Sunday. You got to take your Bible. You, you, whatever the rule might be that you, you had brought up with. Are we just keeping up appearances and the things that we do? Are we just, are, are we really, are we really searching and looking for more on the inside? Are we thinking outside the box? It, and, and one of the questions, you, you know, remember <clears throat> in the garden, remember Satan said, is that really what God said? And so I say, is when somebody says something, it, Jesus is saying, is that what I really said? Or are you listening to me? Are you hearing what I've got to say? Are we looking for more? We go through the years trying to replicate the faith of our parents, our grandparents, on up. But it just doesn't work for us. And there's no, no reason for us to even be pretending to make that work because our faith is supposed to be inside. It's supposed to be ours. We're supposed to possess it. And it's supposed to be ours. And, and if it's not helping us, and if we're just pretending to go through, we'll soon discover that our faith, faith wasn't ours at all. That it was someone else's. It's hand-me-down. It's second-hand is what it is. It doesn't matter how real your parents' faith was, or anyone else for matter, because you must develop your own faith. You've got to do that. You can't just let it go. A hand-me-down faith is one that you never own for yourself and it will not give meaning to your life because you're holding on to a tradition. You might wear it, but it doesn't say much about who you are because you're pretending. Hand-me-down beliefs become a burden and they weigh you down. It sets us up for failure as a Christian when we do hand-me-downs. The reason being is because when we hear hand-me-downs, the bar is set so high, we said, I can't do that anyway. I can't go. The church, people, Christians, oh, they've got it so much together. I'm not even going to go to church. There's so many things that we do that and we say the bar is too high that Jesus is talking about. But if you don't believe in God because of your own convictions, there's no point in predicting uh, pretending that you believe it all. So you might have to second check yourself. First hand faith is centered on deep, deep within your mind and your own heart. And, and that faith thing is something that you learn by studying and, and getting a close relationship with Jesus. Faith is a work in progress. But it's your faith. It's every one of us in this room's faith. Because first-hand faith is so real and personal that it gets stronger when it's challenged. If you know it firsthand. If you know it secondhand, you're going to have a problem. Because we need to trade in our hand-me-down uh, faith and second-hand faith for a first-hand faith. Amen? That's what it's all about right there. You see... When we talk about it, today, we, sh we should believe more boldly than ever that Jesus is the Son of God, that He had a perfect life, that He died for the entire world's sins. Now, now we, and we can center that in on us, but, but God loved everybody. He sent Jesus for everyone. He lived a perfect life. And he was, uh, died for the entire world's sins and he was resurrected three days later and ascended into heaven. That right there is, is the basis. That ought to be the, the, where we start at of what we need to look and see. It goes on to say, or it doesn't go on to say, <laughs> that only through faith in him can we be rescued from our brokenness and find a new, fresh, everlasting life. That's the only way. We can try other things because don't we do that? Don't we seek out other things? Uh, uh, some folks do alcohol. Some folks do uh, buying things and making sense. But nothing, nothing will bring a new, fresh, everlasting life but faith in Jesus. We need to clear up all our preconceived ideas of what Christianity is about. We need to look past shallow, judgmental people 
with superficial religion. Those people that say, well, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't do that. Don't judge lest you be judged. You know, all those things that folks will whip on you. You know, those one word sentences and everything that they'll try to get you. Uh, uh, set back or get off your case a little bit. We need to even look at, look at past bad experiences at church. How many times have you talked to somebody and you invite them to church? Well, I had a bad experience at church. I had a bad experience. I'm not going back. Well, you know something? They've got to work through that and get through those things and get back. Listen, you can't get firsthand faith from your parents or your friends. Firsthand authority faith is unique to you. Each person in this room. Each person in this room. Listen, you know what the dictionary says about firsthand? It's direct from the original source. That doesn't mean that I just heard it on the radio this week. It doesn't mean that we were talking about it at the coffee table. It doesn't mean that we heard it at the water fountain, what they did at church Sunday. It means that firsthand, you heard it from the original source. How do we have more personal faith? Is to how, know how personal God is. Because, listen, it's more than being good. It's more than going to church. It's more than following a set of rules. First-hand faith will get you into a mess. Or get you through the mess, excuse me. Second-hand faith will get you in a mess. Because you've only heard it. Because, you see, one of the examples in the Bible of that is, is when Saul became Paul. Because, uh, talking about Judaism and Jewish religion, God's law was given to the Israelites through Moses during the wilderness journey. They gave, God gave it to them at Mount Sinai. He gave them the Ten Commandments and sacrifices of how to do sacrifices. How many people do you know when you talk about, well, I know the Ten Commandments, man. I had never done anything about them. But Saul, let's talk about Saul for a minute because it's going to take us to his conversion. Saul was brought up by Jewish parents and he had Jewish education. Listen, he was a sharp guy. He was the, one of the only scholars of all the disciples. Listen, he could dress like a Roman, man dressed nice. He could talk like the Greeks. He could talk Hebrew. He could mix in among all of them. And so he was schooled in Judaism, in the Jewish religion. But you know what he was taught and excelled in? In that old way, the old way. I, and I'll, I'll straighten that out in a minute. And it's not the old way, but the Old Testament. But you know what? He was headed for a collision, wasn't he? He was headed for a collision. Because, listen, let's talk about that for just a second, Judaism. Did you know that there's 613 commandments in the Torah? Those 613 commandments are in the Bible, by the way. 613 of them. But they got another book that's called the Talmud that will interpret those 613 rules and it's 2,711 pages double-sided to explain those 613 commandments. It's called the owner's manual for the Torah. It's the first five. The Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament. Listen to some of them. I just, I, I scanned down them and saw them. Number 348. Now, listen, I hope that you hear what I'm saying when I say not living by rules. Because, I mean, we could walk out of here today with a checkoff sheet and come back next Sunday and turn it in. Man, I didn't do any of that stuff. And that's a, kind of that's what I feel like that they did back then. Listen to number 348. Not to tattoo the body like idolaters. I'm not going to ask, has anybody got a tattoo? 365. A man shall not wear woman's clothing. Hmm. 366, a woman should not wear men's clothing. And I'll stop right there for a minute. Who's ever heard when you were going to church that ladies are not supposed to wear pants to church? Anybody? Uh-huh. How about the cutting of hair, short hair, long hair, on top of the head hair, all that kind of stuff? You see how, how 
hand-me-downs come in those things? Do you see it? Listen to this. Number 367 says that garnets of wool and linen cannot be worn together. Okay. So if y'all want to run to the bathroom and change real quick and come back, you can do that. <laughs> Number 387. Now listen to this one. Number 387, a person with a physical blemish cannot enter, uh, let's, let's, no, a physical ble blemish cannot serve in the sanctuary. Number 388, that same person, a person with a blemish cannot enter the sanctuary further than the altar. I like this one, 427, because I, I thought about our church and this one says, a person is not to use steps to approach the altar. Bloop! You know what I'm saying? So you don't sin. So do you see? So his hand-me-down faith from his people, that, that's what they did. 613 commandments, 2,711. And isn't that human nature to want us to have steps or, or check-off marks for everything that we do? But his hand-me-down beliefs from his people ran straight into the coming of Jesus. Because guess what? Old Testament, then guess what? They moved from Judaism to Christianity. Here's Jesus walking around preaching the word and preaching the gospel of how to be saved. So Jesus came, the New Testament. Jesus observed all of God's law and was perfect in it. So that we can't throw that away. We can't throw it away, but we have to listen to what Jesus says. But Saul continued his rampage. But he had, when he met up with Jesus, or met this collision with Jesus, he had to reevaluate his beliefs. Listen, in Acts 7, you don't have to turn there. In Acts 7, he consented to Stephen stoning. You remember, they put, chose the deacons, and Stephen was the first one. Stephen went to preaching, and man, here's Saul. Man, they all throw them rocks. Y'all throw them rocks. He consented to Stephen's death in that time. Acts 8, he continued havoc in the church, it says. Acts 9, he was still breathing ch uh, threats and murder against Christians because it was different than the rules and regulations that he had as to Jesus, what he was teaching. Made a big difference, doesn't it? So the church then was in a time of persecution and the church had separated around all in the area. But Saul had an encounter with the truth, didn't he? You know how he did that? I'm just going, you don't have to turn, you can turn there if you want to, Acts 9. I'm just going to scoot through it because I want to tell you how he got converted. Saul, Acts uh, 9, verse 1 says, Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord and he went to the high priest. He, he went to the high priest and he asked for letters. Now, now listen, he was the super, super, super Pharisee because he was raised as a Jew. He believed, man, he believed those 613 things. He believed them to the, and so these people here are talking about Jesus and accepting Jesus and being saved and Gentiles, he was making a world of difference. And so he saw that. So he was still breathing threats of murder. He asked for letters from, of all places, the high priest, so that he could find anyone that was a part of the way. And that's what they called it back then, the way, followers of Jesus. Whether it was men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he journeyed to uh, Damascus, and suddenly a light shined in his face. A light shined in his face from heaven. Verse 4 says, He fell on the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, Gary preached that here a while back. But you know what the, the real question would be? Mike, Mike, why aren't you more faithful to me? Mike, Mike, why aren't you paying attention to what I'm trying to teach? This is Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Verse 5. Guess what Saul said? 
Who are you, Lord? He, capital L. Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And it's hard for you to kick against the goads. He goes on, six. So he, trembling and astonished, Lord, you remember this in our devotionals here a while back? Gary said, write it down and remember it. What do you want me to do? That's what he said. He says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, get up, go to the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The man, the men with him and everything, they were speechless. Now, listen, I thought this was pretty neat. The men who journeyed with him stood speechless, but they heard a voice, but they didn't see anybody. So God was revealing himself even then. Look at 8. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no, more, no one. But then they led him by hand and brought him back to Damascus. He was there. He was there. He was three days without sight, neither eating or drinking. He had a pretty good encounter, didn't he? Got his attention. All right, now then, after the conversion, turn in your Bibles to Galatians 1 if you want to. Because Galatians is what Paul wrote. See, he changed his name, remember, from Saul to Paul. Galatians 1.11. Now this is Paul speaking, and this is what I'm talking about this morning. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. See, he's done converted over. He's done changed his, his tune now. For I neither received it from man nor was I taught it. He's talking about that conversion from Judaism to Christianity. He says, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. He had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, a personal encounter with him that changed his life, changed everything that he knew and was brought up knowing. Go on with 13. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. He even admits it. Of how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. 14. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries. He was the chief, chief, chief Pharisee by them. Many of my contemporaries in my own nation being ex more exceedingly zealous for the, the last little bit of this says, the traditions of my fathers. What he'd always been taught. Didn't go look for it himself. Just what he had been taught. And he believed in it and he did it. He gave up his hand-me-down religion that went against his father, his grandfather, his mother, against tradition, against Jewish ancestors. So what do we learn from his encounter there? It was a decision time for him when he had this encounter because I think one of the things is, is when we learn better, we do better. Not what I heard, not what the rules say, but what it means to me when I read God's word. We take our faith for granted. We don't study our Bibles. We don't check facts. We just hand me down religion. We don't know our Bible. We don't know what it teaches. We don't even practice what the Bible teaches. And how, do we, how did we come to that? How, how is it? Let me show you something. Now turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5. This is a Sermon on the Mount. As Gary would say, if I stole a sermon, this is it. Matthew 5, verse 17. Because Jesus is fixing to set them up for this. All right. Verse 17 says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm not trying to get rid of the Old Testament at all. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth passes away, that the word of God will be forever. The word of God will be forever. 
One jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. But the law will be accomplished if we read God's word. He goes on to say, 19, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of God. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, he shows the danger of the, neg of the neglect and the contempt of moving away from what God's word says, even the commandments. He's going to explain that in just a bit. For I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, listen, meaning that you got to do more than just check off the list what you've done and what you haven't done. You will by no means enter the kingdom into heaven. You see, all of those rules back there that I read you, or th those, th those numbers that I gave you, you can read all 600 of them. All of them are scriptural. But you know what it says beside it? It says affirmative or negative. It's a negative one. And so the Pharisees really, if you think about it, they were really oppressors, weren't they? They were really against Jesus and his gospel. The gospel is not about the bad. The gospel is about goodness, isn't it? So why should we stick to the rules, the rules, and think we break it as opposed to what God says or what Jesus says by looking at it? All right, continue down now. And scoot through this. So Jesus goes on and he starts teaching on some of the commandments and some things because this is, this is the key that I want you to hear. You have heard that it was said to those of old. Did you hear the word said? Didn't say anything about the scripture says. You've heard it said. You shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. See, Jesus changes this to, to more heart than things that you do. Because he said, sure, killing's forbidden. That's, that's a no-brainer. But they're speaking externally and not about the thought of it. Because Jesus is going to go ahead and, and explain it too. Because he's talking about the act of murder. Look at 22. Jesus says, but I say... Jesus the authority, Jesus the one that was with God when the Ten Commandments was done, the same Jesus that was from the beginning, creation, and Jesus says, this is what we meant. And he goes on to explain it. He's talking about rash anger here. He says, uh, to you, whoever is angry with his brother. And he goes on to explain that. He's talking about heart murder is what he's talking about. He's talking about that the beginning of murder is maybe being angry with somebody and then escalate, escalate, escalate up. He goes on. I, I'm not going to read it all to you. He, he even talks about uh, you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. And, and what he's talking about there when you start calling people names, that's tongue murder. You know, it's not always about killing somebody. Then he goes on to say how, how different it is there, remember that your brother has something against you and you must be first reconciled with him. He means go, before you go, bring your altar up here. It's more important, it's more important for you to go to your brother and make it right than to bring money up here. That's different. That's different than you shall not murder because when we talk to somebody about faith or, or loving the Lord or coming to church, well, man, I ain't never killed nobody. I ain't never stole anything. I never committed adultery with my neighbor's wife. You, you could go right down all of them. Man, I'm perfect. I did the Ten Commandments. But that's what Jesus is explaining here. It's, it's bigger than that. You've got to think bigger than that and, and move through that. So in 21 then, he says, you've heard it, but I say, but I say. Drop down to 27. He's going to talk about the law of uncleanness. The first one there, he was talking about the Sixth Commandment, by the way. 
The seventh commandment is the next one. He said, you've heard it said. You hear that? You heard it. You heard it. You shall not commit adultery. But I say, now let's talk about what they say. <laughs> you shall not commit adultery. What, what is that? You know, it's easy to say, no, I haven't. I haven't ever done it. But he's talking about heart adultery. He's talking about heart adultery. He's talking about sinful passions. He's talking about sinful appetite. And then he goes on to talk about the eyes, because we'll talk about that in just a second. He says, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than just I ain't never done it. He goes on to say, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust at her has already committed adultery. Listen, you feed the eyes. You feed the eyes with adultery by the things that you've done. He goes on to talk about that eye. You remember this in 29? He says right in the middle of it, if it causes you to sin, pluck it out. What he's saying there is if there's nothing else, if there's nothing else that'll stop you doing it, if, if God's Holy Spirit living in you says this ain't right, don't do it, and then you better pluck your eye out because you're going to keep doing it if you don't do it. He goes on to say, what about your hand? If your hand, if you're touching something that you ought not to be touching and you can't quit touching it, you might better cut that hand off. So Jesus was serious about this. If there's no other way to avoid those things, then take that drastic need. Look, look down at 31. I'm skipping through the Sermon on the Mount. You need to go back and read it. Don't take it for word what I said. So he, he continues uh, the seventh commandment because he's talking about marriage is sacred. Now, now listen to this one. Furthermore, it has been said, this is Jesus speaking, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce, period. You know what he's saying right here? Or what they're saying? Just because you don't like the person, you can't run them off. It's got to be done the right way because... But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual morality uh, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is diver divorced commits adultery, there's more to it than just that, just than sending them off. You've got to do it God's way. So look at 33. Again, he says, look at 33. Again, you have heard that it's said... In those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. It's the third commandment. But 34 says, listen, not, not the do nots, but I say to you, do not swear at all. Don't swear at all. Neither by heaven or heaven's throne or God's throne, by earth, by foot. Don't swear on anything. You know what he's saying? He says you ought to be true to the things. He goes on to say, let your yes be yes and let no be no. So you don't have to swear. I swear that's the truth. That's the way you ought to do it. Your yes ought to be yes. Your no ought to be no. And you ought to be content with a yes or a no. Can I get an amen? He goes on. He's continuing now. He's continuing this same thing. Because he's talking about going the second mile. Look at 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You ever heard that? But it's not, it's not what God intended, or what, it's not what they intended, or what God intended, or Jesus intended. An eye for a life, a tooth for a life, you see, it's inconsistent because that's what most people do. So it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for two. It's equal. It's whatever happened to you, then the next thing. He's talking about the law of retaliation here. But listen, you've heard it in 38, but 39 he says, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other one to him. This is a New Testament teaching, isn't it? Listen, 
You know what he's saying? He's saying, forgive the injury. It ain't worth it. Forgive the injury. It's just not worth it. Continue on. He talks about, look at 40. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, give him your cloak too. You know what he says? Just go buy another one. Just give it to him. It ain't worth it. It's not worth it. What he's talking about here, he's talking about bear these things patiently. Just pass it by. Don't let it be a big thing. Take no notice of it. Don't even acknowledge it. You hear what I'm saying? Your witness, your witness in this, forget it, forgive it, and move on. Scripture says, though, even if a man laughs, laughs at you for walking away, look at the witness that you had as a Christian. Look at the witness that you had. He goes on about uh, if he compels you to walk one mile, go ahead and go two miles. And he's just, the, the reason being, his, his thinking is, is uh, remember the anger starts murder? So you're just going to start an argument. You ain't getting my coat. You ain't getting my coat. Well, I am going to get your coat. And then boom, 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 boom. You see the, the climbing of it going up. But you know something? He goes on in 42, though, and he clears, clears it up again. Give, it, give to him who asks of you. Listen, he says, maybe, maybe he's too bashful to ask for it. Maybe he's down and out on his time. So just give it to him. Just lend it to him. Be charitable. Just do it on. Look at there. Look at 43. Again, Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it was said, you shall love, now listen to this one, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Do you think that that's what God would say? Forty-four says, but I say to you, love your enemies. That's the opposite, isn't it? That's the opposite. Because, you know, in those rules that we read a while ago, did you know they could choose who their enemies were? And you can go down it and you can see, well, these kind of people, and they named them. Uh, you don't have to like them. You don't have to like this guy. This guy, if he's got this blemish or this whatever, you don't have to like him. So they were choosing who their friends were. And, and the main thing was, is their interpretation of your neighbor. Guess what? That was a person that was pleasant to look at. I found that. It was a person that's pleasant to look at. <laughs> kind of throws you for a loop, doesn't it? But you can hate your enemy, but Jesus says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good. Do real kindness to them. And pray for them. Pray God's will is forgiven to them. Because you're going to prove yourself to be, look at 45, you're going to prove yourself to be that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise and the rains. You remember you heard that? It rains and on the just and the unjust. That's where that comes from right there. Because God is consistent, isn't he? It's still going to rain. still going to rain on everybody. So that's what it's about. It's about our witness. It's about how we do those things. I just want to remind you real quickly. If you didn't underline, you've heard it said of old, but I say. You have heard it was said, but I say. Furthermore, it has been said, but I say. Again, you have heard that it was said, but I say. You have heard it said, but I tell you, you have heard it was said, but I say to you. But listen to this. In Mark, Jesus says this. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Do you have hand-me-down religion? Is it what you always have seen and done? Because every one of us ought to be fresh and new. You ought to hear something and then go to God's Word and prove it. 
I think I just proved my point right there. Because you have said, but Jesus says. And that's what's important for us, for each one of us in all of our lives, is to test it for ourselves. Study it, test it. See, Saul, when he was mean and everything, he was doing everything he thought was right. Then he had an encounter with the Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ. And that changed his whole life and outfit. All that stuff, the cheerleader that he was in the old is the cheerleader he is in the new. He wrote so much in our book, or the Bible. He wrote so much. Throw away, throw away the hand-me-downs. Throw away the second-hand stuff. Start fresh. Start fresh today. Start with, Lord, teach me. Teach me your way. Allow me to be what you want me to be and not what other people think I ought to be. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, we can get so caught up sometime in, in, in listening to great preachers, listening to them on the radio without, without our Bibles with us, Father. And we say, oh, that's so cool. Oh, that's so neat. And Father, we can hear those things and, and, and not check it out for ourselves to, to register it in our hearts and in our minds. Father, will you please this morning, before we leave this place, Father, can we leave our hand-me-downs? Can we leave our second hand? Can we step out of here, Father, saying that I am committing myself to God's Word, what it says, and Father, I'm going to apply it to my life. Now then, Father, Yes, that makes a high, high goal for us to do. But you know what, Father? You also said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess where we failed you, you're faithful to forgive us. Father, just we're a work in progress. We're, our faith is a work in progress. Father, help us to walk out of here today, Father, with the assurances, the assurances that God is my Savior and my provider and my guider. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that comes and lives in us, Father. Father, I ask now that as we sing a song, Father, that you work, you work through this crowd, Father. You, you know what's in their hearts and in their minds. And Father, I ask that you just touch them and you excite them about the things that you're going to do for them these next days, weeks, months, years of their life, Father. Help us to start fresh today, a new, fresh beginning with you. Father, don't let us have what was told of us of old, but what you say. Father, we praise you, we love you, we seek your face in all that we do. Father, have your way with our folks today. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.